Good morning, everyone. Today is 20 November, the year 2004. I'm Dr. Dave Thompson, a volunteer at the Palm Springs Air Museum here in California. Part of our mission is to record and preserve the history of our country's military conflicts, especially World War II. As part of the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress, We are rolling, yes, sir. You want me to look on the camera? Oh, it, we're, it, that doesn't matter, wherever, wherever you're comfortable. Good morning, everyone. Today is 20 November, the year 2004. I'm Dr. Dave Thompson, a volunteer at the Palm Springs Air Museum here in California. Part of our mission is to record and preserve the history of our country's military conflicts, especially World War II. As part of the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., we conduct interviews of veterans and civilians who participated in those conflicts. Today, I'm here at the museum and have the honor and the privilege of interviewing Sergeant Donald Cravens. Sergeant Cravens was a combat photographer with the Army Signal Corps in Europe during World War II. So we're going to talk to him about that and uh, some other things. Nice to have you here, Don. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Don, would you uh, spell your full name for us, please? Donald Howard Cravens. With an S on the end. Okay. And uh, C R A V E N S. Yes, I tell people I'm a, that part of the family that never lost their S. <laughs> You're Craven, a Craven, but not they a Craven coward. <laughs> they usually remember that. Yeah. Um, and uh, when and where were you born? I was born in Peoria, Illinois, um, May the 2nd, 1921. Okay, which makes you? 83. 83 years young. Um, what was your father's name? Frederick Howard Craven. And what did he do? He was in the grocery business. Uh huh. And uh, where did his ancestors come from? Uh, how did they get well, to Peoria uh, and everything? Uh, Craven's. Uh, with, uh, I went, went back to England a few years ago, and there I kept hearing in the family about a woman, I guess two or three generations ago, uh, set up a business of making candies, Craven's Candies, and they're, they're in the U.S. even today. Uh, so I wanted to take Peggy, and we got on the train and went up to the factory, which was north of London, about an hour's uh, flight, I mean, drop. we went on the train. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, the head of, uh, of advertising was uh, there to meet us and took to the factory. Well, I had visions of a little garage in the back of a property uh, making candy. When I got there and got to, I had five acres under roof. Wow. And it had been sold to a bigger company, but they still keep the name, and they still, and that was, as I say, in England. Do, what was the town? Do you remember the name of the town in that? Um, I do. If I can get a map, I can tell you. Okay, sure. that's fine. Um, and uh, your mother, what was her maiden name, her full name? Her name was Winifred Leona Spears. And how about her ancestors? Where did they all come from? Uh, well, she was uh, generally, I think, um, the... Her grandparents uh, came from Ireland. My grandfather was very Irish. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, when did your mom and dad, where did they meet? Where did they meet? Uh -huh. In Peoria, Illinois. In Peoria, okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, now you grew up probably kind of during the Depression. What was that like for you? Well, Folks did a good business. My mother made uh, fast foods uh, there every day, and pe working people would come and just as they do today, and yeah. take it home uh -huh. for, for dinner. She, she was a very good cook. Yeah. And you, your dad uh, was able to. Uh, of course, people have to eat, so yes. I guess you're in the right business when you yeah. got a, a grocery store or whatever. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Yeah. Did he? Uh, how, did he? 
did he, did his father have a grocery store too, or how no. did he get into that business? His father had a farm in Central Illinois there. Okay. And he came out of that into the city. Yeah. Did you have any brothers and sisters? I have. I have two brothers. They still live in the, in the Peoria area. Uh huh. And uh, what are their names? Uh, Jack and Bill. So you, were you guys pretty close growing up? Were you fairly close in age? I mean, did you play no, together? We were five years uh, apart for each other. Oh, really? <laughs> um, did you, when you were growing up, did you have odd jobs and things that you did? Did you work around a grocery store? Or, oh, or yeah, I drove a deliver. That's when they delivered, like Jensen's does today. Yeah. And I drove the delivery truck and uh, uh, gave them the bill and they paid it, and I. What kind of what kind of truck was that, or what what year was it? Was it an old truck that you drove around? Uh, no, I don't think it was too old. Maybe two or three years old. Yeah. Um, do you remember the first car that you had? That I had. Let's see. That was in California. Yes, it was a 1939, I believe it was, Plymouth two door. <laughs> yeah. Um, did you play any sports in high school? Uh, no, I didn't. Okay. Where I did photograph you photograph sports? Oh, 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 so you were interested in photography early on. Then. Early on. How, where did you? How did you get interested in it? Well, my grandfather worked for the Corps of Engineers, and uh, was captain of a steamboat, and he was responsible, to see that the traffic moved along the Illinois River between St. Louis and Chicago, and uh, when I was very young, five or six years old. Sometimes I got to go with him on a thing, and he, uh, he, being the captain, he had a very nice cabin, and that was very exciting <laughs> to me as a kid. And mm -hmm. when there were floods, a couple of times later on, mm -hmm. went down to what they call it, Cairo, Illinois, right? Yeah, and uh, photographed uh, some of the earliest pictures I had in the local paper was people uh, uh, flooded out on the roof of buildings. And so. Cairo is that where the Ohio and the Mississippi uh, join? It's for the Illinois and the Mississippi. Illinois and Mississippi, okay. I, I think the Ohio joins well, with the Illinois River just a little north of that. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, but that was uh, it was a lot of fun for a, a kid to do that. Um, did, so you, uh, in, well, first of all, tell me what uh, gram which grammar school did you go to? I went to Peoria High School, or grammar, grammar school. school, I don't remember. Yeah, okay. I went to Two, I guess, we moved. Did you live right in town, right in Peoria? Yeah, mm -hmm. Do you remember the street you lived on, or uh, Knoxville? I think was the uh -huh. name of growing up. Yeah. So, but you, um, so did you like work on the yearbook and stuff like that too? And yes, uh -huh. did you? Yeah. Sports and yeah. what kind of cameras did you have to work with? Well, that's interesting because I started out with a box brownie when I was twelve, or, and. Uh, my grandfather had a month's vacation every year, being with the government, and uh, he bought me an Argus C3 camera. It's one of the first popular 35 millimeters in the U.S., uh, American made. Mm -hmm. And so, and I would go with him on vacation sometime to Florida. I know we went to Niagara Falls one time, and I would photograph our trip, and and that's. How that came yeah. about. Oh, okay. and, oh, let's see. When I was 12, and I think uh, with that Argus C3, I uh, made a photograph which was for the Associated Press, a contest for for amateurs. Mm -hmm. And behold, I, I won the uh, first prize of the, of the uh, uh, Associated Press camera. And with that, the local paper gave me a. I started out working in the lab and so on when I was about, oh, 13, 14 years old. Really? What, do you remember what the, uh, the first that picture was of? Yes, it was a, a little girl about eight or nine years old sitting in a window eating grapes. And the frame around the window had no paint on it. it was a nice, that added to the picture. 
Yeah. So what is important about what makes uh, one photographer or what he does uh, better or than someone else? Uh -huh. what, what do you think? Uh, well, it's, that's very simple. It turns out better pictures. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you can tell the difference to the beef. Yeah. Is it the composition or the it's subject? All of those things. Yeah. Composition. That's you know the background and so on. Yeah. But anyway, that's what, that really started me off and making a few dollars. Then. So, and what year did you graduate from high school? Uh, Nineteen thirty-nine. So, and you, I think you had mentioned that you went to California, did you go to SC, to college? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how, did you get a scholarship or how did you end up going there? Uh, I, I uh, uh, let's see, oh, I had a friend uh, in uh, high school that had been to California, his family, and they came back to Peoria and he was telling me what a fabulous place uh, Southern California was. And he was going back to go to SC, and that's partly what inspired me to go to SC because he was a buddy. Yeah. And uh, so I, I went uh, in 1940. I don't remember the month, but but I I, I went to, to night classes, and I worked in the daytime for a Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company out on Central Avenue. Oh, yeah. And it just I mean we got we were into the war, and I was in the self sealing gas tank division. Oh. <laughs> we were just starting it out and the, yeah. uh, and they have neop uh, neoprene outside and gum rubber inside mm -hmm. so a bullet went through it. Uh, it wouldn't leak. Yeah, it wouldn't explode. Like the ja I know the Japanese Zero were not self-sealing a lot. You see these photographs and it just explodes right. Right, when it goes in the gas tank. So that was a big a big plus for our planes to be able to have those. Now, in fact, uh, the most interesting, I worked on the ones that did the bombing over Japan with General, I forget what, uh, the Eker, famous Eker, General. Eker, one. maybe, yeah, or, 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 yeah, okay, Spats. Okay. Did, um, uh, I, I meant to ask you, Prior to moving to California, had you just done still photographs, or had you done any no, movies? No, I just did still. Just still. Okay. Yeah. And um, do you remember what you were doing December seventh, nineteen forty-one? Yeah, I was washing uh, our car. My buddy and I had a uh, nineteen thirty-nine Plymouth two-door. He went into the Air Force, and so I took over the car. And when I was going to the service, I went to the dealer there and said, "Look, I want to turn the, trade this car in a new car." Of course, you couldn't get a new car, and uh, so I said, "Well, I want to trade." And when I come home, I want to get a new car. Would you believe it? It worked out. Is that right? right. And what the car was worth, working for Goodyear, I got well, I got triple something, fancy tires because I got them right there at the factory. Yeah, and I think the tires were worth more than the car. <laughs> so you were washing your car when you heard? Would you hear it yeah, on the radio or something, or did somebody just? No, tell you? Uh, we had a friend who uh, taught at SC, and he, he came out of the house and said that uh, Hawaii had been bombed. So when you were going to night school, you were taking cinema photography classes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. yeah. Um, Until I. Went in the army, and of course they put me right in a photographic thing. So uh, did you did you join the army right away then after uh, Pearl Harbor? What? After at that time, twenty one was uh, either you enlisted or you were drafted. drafted. Yeah. And because I wanted to go be in the photographic end, I enlisted, and I don't remember, but I was twenty one. I, I remember that right after I was twenty one. And where did you where did you go for your training and stuff? Uh, uh, Fort Sam Houston, Texas. Mm -hmm. So you went kind of through a basic training, and then yeah, then they, they the then you put everybody in. has to do, and then uh, a group of us was an officer. I, I just saw we had something about about the tenth Mountain Division, and we called it the tenth Light Mountain Division, in, in our newsletter, and um, uh, so I and an officer 
and another cinema photographer, actually still photographer, and we did a training film on the 10th Light Mountain Division. They were all Swedes and Norwegians. Oh, yeah. And uh, we went in the mountains and, and uh, put together a film for a training of, oh. of uh, ski troops. I see, yeah. In, in where was this? Camp Carson, Colorado, which is now called Fort Carson, I believe. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, so when did you go overseas? Um, 19... I'm trying to think the year. Uh, before, about six or eight months before the invasion of Normandy. So, okay, so early, uh, early, know, early yeah. 44, or late 43, we probably, on, yeah. On a troop ship, it had been a passenger ship. We had hammocks. <laughs> it was a lousy, well, I'm always reminded of that, of some of the cruises we take now. <laughs> we had a, a, a net, I mean a hammock, mm -hmm. you know, sleep in, and of course the ship rolls and the hammock. <laughs> I think, I forget how many days it was, I think six or seven days, yeah. and we landed on the west coast, I forget the city right now, and uh, then we went, to, the whole company went to a little town called Chipping Sodbury, in the <laughs> middle of England, Yeah. and uh, then some of us went on detached service uh, to the uh, battalion, the photographic battalion, let's see, I should have uh, written these things down, but uh, we, we went into London, a group of us, so about six or eight, and we were there for months and, and until the invasion. I had requested to go with the troops, and they were kind enough to let me. <laughs> That's something I regretted many times. Uh, talking about being in London, did they, uh, were they ha the Germans sending those buzz bombs and stuff in no, the that London? No, that was before, that, just that, be before that, that. They were still sending planes over. Oh, they though. were. Oh. And on this uh, photographic headquarters, 33 Davy Street, I've been by there not too long ago telling Peggy that's where we met. We, we worked in the lab, mostly those of them. Uh, but, um, uh, when the Germans would come around, so our building was, say, four or five stories, and another photographer and I went up on the roof and, and pointed our camera. We had four by five speed graphics. B -b Believe it or not, it was the official camera for combat. Can you imagine? <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, I still have pictures. Just open the lens, you know, and you can see the uh, aircraft uh, guns going off and uh, I think we can see the planes, the German planes, in the picture. <laughs> were these again? Were these still or moving? Still. still. Okay. Do you have any any of those photographs? I think I around? have a shot of that Do you? somewhere. I'd love to have a copy of it. Yeah. yeah. For it's an interesting be good picture. To... Oh, I bet. Because yeah. you can see the aircraft going across the film and. Yeah. Like so by this time, are you still just doing stills, or had you got into movies? Oh no, I, I was in movies at the start, but. You couldn't make a movie of no, that. No, I know, right, yeah. And uh, What kind of movie cameras were you using then? Uh, Bell and Howell, Imos, 100 foot loads, uh -huh. and it was a turret lens, three lenses way out of them. I think they weighed 16 pounds. I was going to ask you how heavy oh, those things yeah. were. <laughs> and that was one of the things that I concentrated on the landing, was keeping the camera dry. Oh, yeah. Uh, because they put us a dropped us off at about waist high, for which I was grateful. Like, a lot of guys got it over their head. Absolutely. And, uh, but... Uh, did did uh, you see the movie Saving Private Ryan? Yes. That, most people that I talked to that were there said that that's pretty, pretty much like it was. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. when they were... Okay, so, uh, let's go, go to the invasion then. Um, who, who would they, who did they assign you to? Who'd you go in with? Uh, which I was, group? Uh, uh, I was going to be assigned. I didn't go in with the second infantry. Uh, I think it was a thirty-six or one of the first bunch of. Uh, which which uh, beach? Landed. Which beach did you land on? Uh, Omaha Beach, Easy Red. If I remember it very distinctly. Easy Red, yeah. Well, that's how they were 
calibrated. One of our fellows, Sandy Hershot, was a BAR man. He was with the 29th Infantry that went into Omaha Beach. Uh -huh. Yeah, easy red, huh? <laughs> Which, what section of the beach do you remember? Well, that was? was that was farthest west. And then we had, of course, several other. And then the British landed far, farther down yes. to the east. Yeah. And they had practically no fire. Yeah, yeah. They didn't. But where I landed there, there was a pillbox on top, and Germans with, I mean, with machine guns. And in the earlier phase, I didn't get, I didn't get to the beach until late afternoon. Okay. I was worried about the light. Oh yeah, uh -huh. and uh, that's how I remember it. But um, most of the people in that cemetery, you see, landed in that general area of the, of easy up and down. Right. Yeah. And. Uh, uh, that, that tears me up every time I, I know. think about it or go I'm sure, yeah. So your your camera, the main thing at first was to keep it dry, you said. Yeah. Oh, I've left out a very important thing. The captain of the ship we came in with, then you'd go down a rope ladder and get into the landing craft. And just before, I, I made pictures on the ship while, I, while we were going over, and uh, he gave me two bottles of scotch. And I, <laughs> My main concern was pr protecting them by get a, getting broken. <laughs> and had a camera I've had. Yeah. So you ha you had how many cameras did you have with you? Yeah, just just a, a one. Yeah. And and this was a movie camera you had. Yeah. yeah movie. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Model Q IMO. Uh huh. Did you take any film on the on the landing craft as you were going in towards the beach? Yes. Did you had it running then? Yeah. Yes, I think everybody that went in did that. That was a. Did, that was a shot you could make. Did your film survive? It, we never know, because oh, what oh. happened when you uh, got ready to ship it, you have to write captions, and, um, and then it went into the signal core bag, which is a canvas bag about that big, the roll of film, and, and they used film packs for, on the still. And uh, that would go in and go to the signal core, and in, in the first part of the landing, and so that all went back to England until we were through Paris, and then all the film was processed and so on okay. in Paris. Now when you went in, did you have extra film besides what was in the camera yes, with you? I had 700 feet. Okay. And yeah. that would be like how many minutes, or how many minutes would you say to, or to 100 feet or whatever? It's surprising how long it is. Uh, let's see, we shot, I think, at 16 frames, or maybe 24 frames a minute. and. Uh, it lasts quite a while because uh -huh. you know you just don't turn it on and run it. Right. You photograph things in, in uh, sections. Okay. So when you got out, uh, did you have to jump out into the water, or was you no, able? No. To, they got it up on. No, there was a uh, landing craft. There. I mean, I was on no, the no, ship. No, 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 no. I meant when you got to the beach. Did 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 the landing craft get up onto the beach, or did you have to wade in? When I, you got I think it was about waist high where was we it? got, which was a lot of guys. It was much deeper, yeah, over know. their heads. I I, yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, so when you, what were you filming at that point when you were going out to, I or just, you were just trying to, <laughs> were they still <laughs> shooting at you at that time? Uh, yes. But th this Okay. Uh, I let, let's take let's take a break for just one yeah. quick second. Well, oh, you, oh, you got him some water then, huh? Uh, is that good water? Comes oh, that we have. Mm -hmm. So what we do with those is we take them and we we have kind of friends of the library say and we put them out there and sell to people and it raises oh. more funds for us. So right. so I got them back here and then when we get room we'll put them out there for people can buy them if they want to. Okay. Uh, okay, let's go back to uh, where we were uh, at Normandy, and uh, we're talking about. Okay, and you you had the um, was it sixteen millimeter? No, thirty five. Oh, thirty five. Okay. With three lenses. It the thirty five millimeter. It's wider tape. Oh yeah. It's, we have a thirty five millimeter still camera. That's the same. Same thing. Yeah. 
I, I think we have some 35 millimeter stuff, but I don't have a 35 millimeter projector, so uh -huh. I've never been able to see it. Do you know if there are any around or? There's got to be. Yeah. yeah. Um, I would call the studios. They probably got stuff that they probably. Yeah, you're probably. That's that's a good idea. Or some of the cinematographers with, yeah. with the films, you know, the ASC has uh, yeah. probably that would probably be. So when you got onto the beach, that's in late afternoon right. on that mm -hmm. the first day. Uh, were you still was the still beach still under fire, or had they pretty much suppressed that well, by that where time? I happened, I was lucky to go in. That pretty much was quiet then, or at least it wasn't solid bullets coming out. <laughs> right. And I got in up under a uh, concrete abutment. Oh, okay. And uh, then. Uh, of course, uh, uh, after I got in, uh, I, I went with the 82nd Airborne up to Cherbourg. Oh, you did? Oh, yeah. And uh, um, the, uh, so the, we went in the Jeep sometimes in their Jeep. And, uh, but uh, this was, I think, it was the second day. Yeah. We, we went in. Uh, as I remember, you know, the troops, you see the picture of them all watching the French waving and so on. And uh, they, uh, we, after we were in, we were supposed to at first go with the 2nd uh, Infantry Division. Instead, we, uh, we went to Cherbourg with the 82nd because they took Cherbourg. Right. And uh, of course, everything was. Nothing was like a, a, was planned. Everything <laughs> was ad libbed. The whole thing. Now, um, when you say we, how many people are you talking about? I'm talking about Singapore? myself, still photographer, and our driver carried a machine gun. We didn't have it. Uh, our jeeps came in later, and um, but he had his. He was supposed to cover the photographer with a Thompson submachine gun. And so he was with us and helping us, and uh, I think it was one one day later. I think it was uh, two days later. I think it was the, probably June the ninth that we got up to, with the eighty second and taken Cherbourg. Now, in between where we landed, they had uh, flooded all all that area there, so a lot of the the fellows that uh, parachuted in ended up drowned right there in, the, in those lakes. Yeah. And uh, did you have a? Did you carry a weapon yourself? Yeah, a, a forty-five pistol. Yeah. And they said, if he, if he gets a job, throw it at him. <laughs> it was not considered an ideal combat thing. But that's all. We didn't have room to carry rifles or machine guns. And the three of you. Did you were you did you stay together on the beach pretty much when you came in, or yes, did you get uh, separated, or you guys no, pretty no, much were able to? Uh, somebody, uh, somebody that had I don't know how I guess they dropped jeeps for, for the airborne because they were yeah. the first ones to be mobile. Yeah, and uh, I know if there was a driver, we would get a ride a little yeah. closer to the front to the, that front. Did you stay close to these guys after you got out of the service? Did you stay in contact with no. either one? No. Yeah. Okay. I stayed in Germany and went on to yeah. the business. Okay, so you went up and, um, okay, where did you go from Cherbourg then? From Cherbourg then we came back down and we then joined the 82nd, which was on that road for leading from the beach up. And, they were, and there was an area on a farm Farmhouse, I think they used that. That was G2, G, G1, G2, G3, and G4. They dug big areas in the ground and put um, sandbags over them. Mm -hmm. And so that, and it was under, it was a, a beautiful place. It had a tre two rows of trees that, that came together, so it was perfect cover for, for them. Yeah. And that's, that's where the so I say the G's were, but <laughs> we were on the outside. And okay, I think well, okay. The, what what is G one, G two? What does that signify? G two is intelligence. Right. G G three, I've forgotten. Okay. I know intelligence. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, then when we got back and uh, with the uh, second infantry division, and we we stayed at headquarters, in other words, overnight, because we came back to identify what we had shot during the day. Then it went to a signal corps bag, and until we uh, uh, took over Paris, well, it was all sent back to London for processing. Right. And. Um, but you, you, you knew how to process film too, did you not? I mean, when you, you said you worked in the lab some back in oh, England. Oh, that was a, We were just making big prints of, of the beach oh, I area. See. Oh, uh -huh. the, the Air, 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 Army Air Corps. Right. Everybody talks Air Force. We didn't have any of that. <laughs> yeah. uh, anyway, that uh, no, we, we processed nothing. We uh, yeah. just went to the headquarters where they, where they could process it and analyze it. Right. I mean, it was used partly for intelligence, of what the Germans had or in that. Yeah. Anyway, you know how, how we got the low landing and how we how that came about? Because they didn't want to wake Hitler up on D-Day. <laughs> That's what I've heard. Yeah, they wanted to keep it real quiet and, and secretive and not for them not to know when or where we would land. Yeah. They had done some decoys up up to Calais, I think, uh -huh. and the Germans had moved some of the stuff up there. So, yeah, it was really quite, I mean, when you think about all that went into that, I mean, it, the planning and everything was just amazing. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it is. And how did we do it? Not with great intelligence and so on. Flukes. It was meant for us to take a well, the only way I could describe it, because yeah. a lot of things that never happened, yeah. other things happened. Mm -hmm. Well, that's you know, um, from my uh, studying about it and everything, it seems like the American military or the GI in particular was more resourceful. When things didn't Absol go right, they could. Absolutely. Whereas the Germans were very good at just when set things go just right, you know they you know but. But when things fall apart, they lose their, you know, their yeah. lieutenants or you know their officers. Then they're not as good as, as improvising like yes. our guys seem like. No, that all that. For example, I remember they made you know we're in the hedgerow country. That, that's a lot been said about that. Yes. And right in uh, behind the lines, not very far, they were taking steel from the things that that they uh, in the water that the Germans wanted to keep us out. They take it and made forks out of them and they could go right through the like hedgerow. bulldozers almost, yeah, 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 yeah. that's right. <laughs> okay, so um, so then fr from that area where you were, uh, where did you go from there? From uh, G Well, G we stayed, uh, we didn't move for, what was it, four or five weeks oh, okay. before the, and that was still getting stuff unloaded and it was from the ships. And <coughs> I think after the third day there was no Not problem on the much. beach. Was, yeah. So did you head towards Paris then? Uh, well, we, as I say, we stayed there and made with, with the infantry. But yeah. oh, well, the important thing I learned there, that Calvados is made in Normandy, from that, and they got <laughs> apples. Yeah, we, I still I still drink Cal Cal Calvados. <laughs> yeah, we found that out uh, when we were there a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. But. Uh, so what was the next major offensive basically well, you were involved uh, yeah. in? Was, I think it was five weeks at least. We were practically stagnant, right. building up for the advance down through uh, south of uh, France uh, area. And then, uh, what was that battle called? Where we surrounded the Germans after we went through Normandy and I guess we captured, I don't know, thousands. Yeah. Well, St. Lowe, maybe, or? Well, that, that's, see, I was, the division we were covering in, we were east of San Lowe and, uh, and uh, north of it. And, uh, and of course, the, the divisions were trying to push forward. We had, uh, uh, at night, they would have, what do they call that? When, they, when they're uh, pushing into the enemy's area uh, at night or the, the Infil part, huh? infiltrating or, uh, uh, the, or no that was uh, I 
can't remember the name right now. No, it's okay. But a group of GIs, 8, mm -hmm. 10, 12, yeah. would be going to see where the Germans were. And when the Germans started shooting at them, they knew that's where the front was. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, um, and, uh, let's see, I think it was the 29th on our, on our uh, right, mm -hmm. and they were the ones that took San Lo. Right, that's and right. Now, Sandy, my uh, the fellow I told you that was with the 29th, he got wounded at San Lo. Uh -huh. now, did, you, know, you told me you got two Purple Hearts. Tell yeah. me about that. Where did those take place? How did that happen? Well, this one uh, was um, on the advance to Paris, where they surrounded these people. It was just an airburst, and I have a, a, a scar there, there. Well, you don't, you don't want to say it. Oh, well, well, sure. well that's okay. <laughs> it, it describes it better. Uh-huh. That's why. That's oh, my gosh. piece of shrapnel yes. went in. Oh. They just, they just uh, sewed it up. Or, I think they used clamps on it. Yeah. And huh. uh, So it was uh, like an artillery shell or yeah, something well, that burst? We were under trees, yeah. and it hit those trees. hit those trees oh. and explode and, uh, downward. So that... Uh, did, it bleed, it, bleed, huh? did it bleed a lot? Uh, not too much. Yeah. Oh, wait a it was like, uh, practically down to the bone. Yeah. And I went to, uh, of course, uh, by then they had a medical set up there. And I think, I believe I was in the hospital 10 days and was back at the front in about 10 days. Okay. Did damage your camera or anything? N no. Did you use the same camera all the way through, or did you? Yeah, have no, I, I had the same camera. Really? Yeah. And yeah, they. Uh, I think it was eighty thousand Germans we captured before we went to Paris. Paris, yeah. And then in Paris, uh, we, we went south of Paris, a town I can't remember about eighty kilometers south and a bit west. There I ran into. Uh, I can't think of anything today. Um, famous uh, writer. Ernie Pyle? No, no. Um, let's see. Um, Who could it be? Not Max Brand. No, no. This, uh, this man wrote... Uh, um, the, they were made into... Hemingway? A, Hemingway? Uh, yeah. Oh, you did? Ernest Hemingway. Oh, yeah. And uh, there was a town we were supposed to assemble, a little village town, and we got into it very late in the evening, and there was a barn and a, a stairway up, and there were other troops there, and uh, we went up there and tried to sleep during the night at this assembly place. Uh, and um, we knew there were other troops that woke up in the morning. They were all Singalese. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and But that was a place where we were, and uh, uh, we heard that um, uh, west of Paris, it was open there. So uh, myself and the still man and the driver, we got, but who, who wanted to go along? And another Jeep, Hemingway. And uh, we, we got up there and we got to the city, famous city, uh, west of Paris. And um, um, Hemingway, we, we figured then it had a death, death wish. When we got up there, um, what comes out around a German tank facing us? And we, we thought it was cleared. So we jumped out of the Jeep and got in a ditch. Yeah. But they didn't, <laughs> they turned around and went the other way. <laughs> yeah. Hemingway, he, uh, we always thought he had a death wish because he wanted to do stupid things. Yeah, it seemed that. Seemed that I guess way. It, I guess it looks better on paper. <laughs> yeah. Um, was that Versailles? Was that the area that you were going to? Yeah, Versailles. Versailles. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. The, okay. So, where did you have your other wound? Your other Purple Heart? Where did you get that for? That was the day of the, the beginning of the Battle of the Bulge. Oh. And that's not very well. Piece of shrapnel bounce up. It's near somewhere. Oh, there. yeah, I see. And, uh -huh. and uh, that was the day the Battle of Bolt started. Oh. And, uh, but uh, 
There was a railroad track there. I think this was the 89th Division. Anyway, uh, a Messersmith, I think it was, came flying down this railroad track, and I, like an idiot, I was photographing him, and he let go a burst. I think they had 50 caliber or whatever they, and a piece of it just bounced and hit me there. But it was a combat injury. Well, I said, so. Yeah. <laughs> For it's now I'm able to get my medication, <laughs> and if I didn't have my discharge, it's that the certificate of the Purple Heart that mm -hmm. qualified me. <laughs> and the um, okay, all during the Battle of the Bulge, what where were you? What area were you? Uh, were you near Bastogne was, or? Yes, as a matter of fact, San San Vith, which yes. is right in that area. Okay, Gee, I remembered that one. And uh, we there was a house. Not far from where the front line fell, and was empty, and we went in there and slept in beds during the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, then the other thing is, of course, we had a bunch of Americans that were prisoners, and they they killed about fifty-eight. where they, they dropped down the back of, of the truck, and uh, a lot of them played dead and so on, but uh, we did photograph that uh, the Ger after the Germans left, I mean, the bodies and You so did? On. Yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah. Uh -huh. I think there were 58 killed. I think so. Oh yeah, I remember that. And it was snow, kind of snow on the ground. Oh yes, cold, it? oh, snow was, a see that's, that's why the Germans got so far. We had fog for a week and, uh, and the planes couldn't bomb. When it was real cold like that, oh, was it hard to film? Yeah. And then, I mean, did you have to have gloves on? Or, oh yeah. But you could still run your camera yeah. even though it's yeah, it was just thumb. about this. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, yes. Uh, so we, we were pretty lucky. The first night we got into the, uh, I, I slept in a sleeping bag below a tank where the, the motor was running. So I got. Oh. But the next night, and for I don't know, five or six nights. Huh? That uh, uh, we had this house, we could, and that they had yeah. a stove, and we could make coffee. Mm -hmm. and so well, <laughs> oh yeah, you wanna wanna, wanna sit here? Do you, yes. Do you wanna sit here? Yeah, here you go. Um, the yeah. okay. Go ahead. Yeah, take your seat there. Um, being so cold and everything and foggy, would your lens steam up a lot when you were trying? No. no problem with that, huh? No. We, we, we never took it in, in any place that was warm. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to just put it right there. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So you stayed in that little town all, pretty much all during the Battle of uh, the Bulge? Yes. Uh, okay. And. Uh, uh, I it, was out. Uh, I went to the hospital where they just fixed, oh, right. fixed that up, and uh, I went right on. Yeah, yeah. Did you go into Bastogne afterwards, or did you get into that town? Um, did you do any filming so. there? Okay. I don't think that. Yeah. Let's see. That was the 82nd. Yeah. The 101st. Oh, 101st. 101st came in. Yeah, we we were just there. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, when you went to Malmedy, that had a have some type of an impression, I would think, on you. What what were you feeling at the time when you saw all this? Did you know what had happened, that or that that atrocity had taken place, or did, did oh, yeah. you? Well, I mean, it was uh, the German SS, the, the general was an SS. I know. No, we thought it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a thing to do, but. Right. We expected it from the Germans at that time okay. because they were desperate. Yeah, yeah. But they they penetrated so far because of the fog. Right. And uh, and where did you cross the Rhine? I, oh, that's easy. R the Remagen Bridge. the only the only bridge that was left. Yes. To, uh -huh. And then it I understood after oh. about a week or ten days it finally collapsed because yes. of all the traffic and stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. But you crossed it. Crossed oh it. yeah, early. Before that, we were at Bonn, uh, the Battle of Bonn, and uh, 
and that's why this uh, artillery piece down here was because they had 88s oh. and there was a road that we were coming in on and the Germans used those 88s straight down the highway and they were mean. Oh yeah. Um, but uh, I got into uh, Bonn and uh, the company commander and he was in a, a, a museum that was Beethoven and the, none of the music was there but but and we spent the night there because we were cut off. And um, so, but all night long we heard, you know, the fighting going on, and some Germans got wounded, and so on. And then, when the tanks went down and went over them, and the screaming, uh, I always remember that. Oh yeah. Because mm. they just mashed them. Yeah. But our tanks were going back and forth around. But this museum was right in the center of town, and. Um, Suddenly, just at dawn, the shooting all stopped, and there we were. That's a Bonn's a pretty fair sized city, and uh, and um, then um, long what came up about then? Um, some GI got into this piano store with, across from me were and started to play Beethoven's. I tell you, that whole thing. And I, I was so puzzled. Something should be done with this. Who comes down the road? Two correspondents. One, I think it was National Geographic, and I forget the other one. So I told them this story, and they thanked me a lot. And I took them to where the piano store was, across from Beethoven's little museum. And uh, so from there, we, we we heard about the the bridge was there. So we hightailed it down to the bridge, so we'd get on the other side of the Rhine, and. Uh, Right after we got over the Rhine, we took a left, and there was a well-known winery there, German winery, white wine. I remember we got some, and uh, I still like it to this day. <laughs> <laughs> that Rhine wine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Did you go to any of the um, um, uh, POW camps or any of the uh, oh, concentration yeah. camps? Yeah. When you were POW. Uh, Luft, Stalin Luft three. What one is what? Okay. Up on the uh, near the shore, on the, and there were five thousand Americans or some uh, Australians, I think, the French. There, that were all all had been shot down. Yes. Guys, mm -hmm. and we had a. I was with a. Uh, um, Anyway, there was a, a major there. That was, there were three lawyers, and uh, we all went to the camp to see what the treated. And how I remember a sign said, "Don't the penalty for, for something for eating out of the garbage." And uh, uh, and there were five or six aces, American aces, in there. And I interviewed them and photographed oh, them. And, yeah. and but they descended on us. Who won the series? The last series. Uh, <laughs> And uh, stuff like that you know, yeah. that they they never received the information on, yeah. and so we stayed there for the day. That was in the Russian sector. The Russians had come through there, and because of the passes we had, uh, war crimes stuff, uh, we went through the and went to the Stalag Luft one. But there were quite. But I'm trying to think of some of the aces that were there. Well known yeah. people. Huh. Yeah, did uh, is, um, did you get it to any of the concentration camps? Yes, in, I think it was big, biggest one I saw was in Poland, south of uh, of the capital, and there was a trench about fifteen feet wide and fifteen feet deep, and at that end were bones. Down to this end where we were, it must have been a quarter of a mile or a minute longer. And stuffed with bodies, and the 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 end that we were I was shooting from, there were just bodies in there, but a whole trench full. But, but the Germans uh, eliminated them before they left. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah that was. I'm trying to figure out which one it was in Poland though, yeah. south of the capital. 
but that was pretty stayed with you a long time. Now you, I think you were mentioning that after the war was over, you you stayed over when the Nuremberg trials were going on. Were you? Uh, oh yes. Uh huh. What were you doing there? Or? I was a still photography. First, I was with the military shooting stuff. Yeah. And uh, then uh, I was discharged and went back because the, the Nuremberg trials went on a good year or so. And um, so I went back there shooting for IN, INS. Okay. I, INS, which was? International News Ser Service. Okay. I think the photograph was called INP. Oh, okay, yeah. And um, so did, did you interview people too when you were taking pictures of them? Or did you talk to any of the prisoners uh, or anything like that? Sounds like you've read my script. <laughs> because that reminds me. Uh, Mrs. Herman Goering. Um, she was. Uh, oh, that. I, there was a Excelsior Hotel old, and a bar there, and I went into the bar to have a drink, and there was a guy down several seats, and uh, I looked at him. And he seemed his face seemed familiar. Then when he started talking, he had a. a French accent. And I said, did you land in Normandy? He said, yes. I said, uh, what were you doing? You were, he says, I was an intelligence officer. And uh, so we went over that and uh, I said, what are you doing now? He said, I'm in charge of a prison. Uh, it was west of there. And I said, oh, any famous Nazis in there? He said, no, but Mrs. Herman Goering and her five-year-old daughter are there. And I said, what's she going to be charged with? He said, nothing. She has no place to go. Mm -hmm. Well, being a journalist, that rang a bell. And uh, so I, went, I told the correspondent I was working with about it. And uh, we arranged to go to this prison at midnight and pick she and the daughter and a one trunk she had was about that big. You know, it was quite large. That, that, was, that was all of her possessions then. And um, so we were able to get them out, put not in our Jeep, but the, an army Jeep behind us. And we drove back. We had already scouted north of Nuremberg, where uh, they had a, a home in a, a forest. And there was a, a uh, caretaker there and uh, I mean he wasn't occupying but that's that was a lot a, a cabin and so the reporter and I cleaned it up uh, and put some uh, sea rations there for them and they, they let her out and uh, we got there in almost at dawn in the morning and the reporter inter interviewed her and I photographed her I I may have one of those pictures somewhere. Yeah, I'd love to see uh, that. Uh, the, Mrs. Goring and the daughter. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, we did that, and uh, she asked, could she send a, a note to her husband? And I said, gee, we don't, I, we don't know whether we can get it there, but we could certainly get it to security. And indeed, they did get the letter to Herman Goering, who of course was in prison. And uh, we were going back a second time, part of the interview, and we took his response to her, back to her, and she was more friendly then. But um, we got a couple of good interviews out of her and we got pictures. Oh, that, that's a great story. Yeah. <laughs> and as I say, I have a picture out of the Los Angeles Times Magazine. That I'm trying to think whether I have a print of. Oh, I hope so. Yeah. Anyway, that's that. that's how that <laughs> happened. We're, we're doing a lot better if you ask questions. Than I'd give you the answer. <laughs> well, uh, we were in the uh, courtroom at Nuremberg on our trip uh, a couple of weeks ago. Oh yeah. And, uh, that I guess that they said it's pretty much just like it was then. Uh, it's not all that big. It's fairly small. Uh -huh. you know. Did you notice? I have a picture in the uh, 
COD library of uh, all of them. Do you? Yes. No. Uh -huh. um, but uh, I have a few that there's several partition for photographers, and I was facing them at an angle, and the background there's a big window. That's where photographers get behind and shoot through optical glass mm -hmm. and talk and make noise. And uh, I've used that several several times for covering the, the trial. But um, yeah, I did cover the trial. I think before I before I got out of service. Were you there for the whole trial until no, it was no. over? No, we would go b back and forth after. I mean, yeah. some of it was very dull and nothing yeah. different. If we knew something was coming up, then we would. But I mean, but I mean, were you over there when the trial finished? Still, were yeah. you there at the time when they when it actually I finished? I think so up? because one day. Uh, at a prison uh, west of uh, uh, Nuremberg, they, they hung 12 people. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was 12. And anyway, they hung five or six in the morning. Then what got me was they brought lunch out. And we, right by the gallows, we had lunch. They went back to hanging the rest of them in the afternoon. So you were there and saw uh, the hangings, you mean? Oh, yeah. Oh, really? Did you film those two? Yes. Oh, yeah. Hmm. I mean, that's what we're there for. Yeah. yeah. To prove that the, the trial came to some sure. conclusion. Sure, yeah. Hmm. When you, um, had you been back to the States at all? Did you go back and forth? No. Or you had been over there the whole time? three and a half years. Oh my gosh, yeah. yeah. Did you have, uh, were you married at the time? or did No, you but I got married in Frankfurt for two packs of cigarettes. <laughs> and, and I had agreed with this young lady from Texas that if I survive the war, we'll get married. That was one of the biggest mistakes I ever made. But anyway, uh, so she, she got uh, from some senator, I think Texas, permission and came to France. Oh. And uh, um, I was living I was a civilian then, and I was living at the Park Hotel across from the Bonhoeff, and that was correspondence in Frankfurt. And uh, I forget where we got married, just maybe in the Burgermeister's uh, or the mayor's thing, and yeah. and uh, so I guess we were legally married, I don't know, but <laughs> I, I can't remember whether it was Lucky Strike or Chester. <laughs> yeah. But that, that's, what, that's what they charge for the... <laughs> but cigarettes were money then. Yeah, right. <laughs> and we could buy cigarettes in New Jersey by the case for, I don't know, a few cents a package, and you could sell them for a, equal to $100 for a carton. <laughs> and a lot of things, some of us were looking for Roloflex cameras mm -hmm. at that time, and I think a Roloflex camera was 17 uh, cartons. Oh. It's about 20 till 12. Yes. And you have to be somewhere at 12 o'clock? For my uh, physical fitness. Okay, so you think we should 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 uh, stop right now our interview? Yes. And maybe... Well, I have 11 35. Yeah, where, where do you have to go for your physical fitness? Uh, it's um, in Culver City. It's about, I would say, 10, 12 minutes from there. Oh, okay. Well, I tell you what, I'm just about at the end of my... Okay, Don, um, we were talking about the Nuremberg trial when you mm -hmm. were there, and um, and the last thing I think we were talking about where you saw them hang some of, the, some of them. Mm -hmm. uh, how much longer did you stay in Europe after that, or when did you come back home then? I was over there about three and a half years. Yeah. So and the Nuremberg trial, that was a, I think that went on a year and a half or so. Right, yeah. So as soon as it was over, is that when you came back to the States? No, no. What did you do then, after I, that was over? Oh, I covered um, stories in, a, in Central Europe. Um, one story was in Switzerland, what happened? A, well, lieutenant or captain, 
flying C-46s uh, was there and his father was a general, you know, other generals and the wives, and they were flying from, I don't know, Frankfurt or Berlin, I forget which one, uh, going shopping in Italy. And he got up over the Alps there, there and he, did, he had too many people on and, uh, and he crash landed onto a glacier in Switzerland. And the, and the only there was a child there, a child, <laughs> must have been five foot eight, and, uh, but she was just a teenager, and that was one of the, but uh, as I say, it was all high-ranking officers. The son of this general was the pilot, and he had to land on the top of the mountains, <laughs> and they didn't find him for a week or so. And of course, that was a story, I mean, <coughs> Uh, a domestic story for us, mm -hmm. and uh, so all the press went out to this place in Switzerland where they were bringing him out of the mountains and let him out. And um, uh, when they came down, the Swiss had a big rope across the, there, you know, and we were probably 50, 60 feet from the people getting out of the aircraft. And uh, so I jumped the rope and went in because I. I needed closer shots than that. Mm -hmm. And when I did, all the other correspondents did, and the Swiss raised up. But by then I had my pictures mm -hmm. of all the people getting out of the planes that had been up stuck in the mountains. But I, I think that was pretty embarrassing <laughs> to the generals. Uh, did you prefer taking stills or movies? No, I, after the, the war, I mean, for international, everything was stills. and I, and they provided me with a 4 by 5 speed graphic, which I hated because it was a good camera, but it was just too heavy for that kind of work. Yeah. Anyway, that's... Uh, where, where, where were you based? Where, where were you living at the time? Berlin. In Berlin, yeah. And that's when the, the, uh, they had four sectors of Berlin, right? They had... Yeah, yeah. French, uh, English, and the U.S. and right. and you hear a lot about black market and all that oh, stuff. Did you rampant? I I got to look for Roloflex cameras to go back to the office in New York because they didn't receive it. So I I traded cigarettes for cameras. Yeah, yeah. everybody did. Yeah. Or diamonds, you name it. Were. Um, they started to have trouble with the Russians, the Cold War, was that kind of uh, going somewhere? No, I, I went home before that. Before all that, yeah. they, they got involved in that. Right, with the Berlin airlift and all yeah, that. Uh -huh, yeah, yeah, I, I missed that. <laughs> so when did you come home then? I think it was, I'm trying to think where I went, I went back to England to the office and so on. Anyway, it was about, uh, Two and a half years, I think, uh -huh. yeah. from the time that I worked for them there. And uh, did you work for them in this, when you came home, did you continue to work for no, them? No, I, uh, I went to, um, first I went to New York Times, and they would offer me a job, in time, but I didn't want to live in New York. So then I, I got a, the uh, Ford company, the, the whiz kids, they called them in the Air Force, all these bright young men. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them became car dealers for Ford. Mm -hmm. And one correspondent, who's his brother, I believe, uh, became a car dealer, I think, in Baltimore. And when I got back, I had no deal with them. I got a, a Mercury, two-door Mercury Coupe, very nice car. And I drove that across the country because I stopped in Nashville, and the uh, life correspondent the photographer I worked with at Nuremberg invited me to stay there and introduced me to the, they wanted me to, to go to work. I said, no, I think I'm going go back to Los Angeles. In Los when I got back to Los Angeles, it had grown so in the time, and it was an entirely different place. And I was still edgy, but I mean the war, I had nervous problem. And so I, I Nashville was so, a quiet city, so I went to work for the Nashville Tennessean, 
and I but I also freelance a short time for life and other other advertising stuff. But the paper per permitted me to do that, so I did that for a time until uh, um, I, I went to back to Los Angeles. And, uh, Were you still married at this time? Yes. And have any children? Yes. Um, but the problem was, when we were in Germany, my wife, like I said, complained she wanted to go home. She didn't like being in Berlin. And then uh, when I started working out of Nashville for the paper and for freelance work and advertising work, I was gone all the time. And she wanted me to go back to the paper <laughs> and, and work, work there and, and be home at night. Well, my goal was always Life magazine, and uh, so we got divorced in 1960. I moved to Los Angeles by, by myself okay. and worked out of the Beverly Hills office of Life. Oh, okay, too. Mm -hmm. So that's when you started went to work for Life. Was that then? Uh, well, I. I uh, oh, you had been doing freelance stuff for them previously. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I had a. Let's see, in 1956, I got a contract for, to work with life. Mm -hmm. And of course, I did, I, I got branded the civil rights photographer. And I did lots of those, the beginning of Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. And uh, that stuff went on for a year, a year and a half. And the, the uh, King and other ministers, and they had meetings once or twice a week promoting the civil rights, and so I spent quite a bit of time in Montgomery, Alabama. As a matter of fact, they, there's a you know, I'd say relatively new museum there, or Rosa Parks yes. Museum is there, and I, I have photographs in that museum, and they told me there were eight by ten. I think, you know, eight by ten, you know what that is. There were eight by ten feet. Wow. They've blown up walls, oh walls my gosh. Oh. and it was excited. <laughs> Peggy saw that she cried. Oh, yeah. Did, <laughs> were you ever fearful when you were in those, oh, everything that was going on down there? Very cautious, yeah. But I, I had a, a lot of the black people that knew me and were, uh, protected me. Uh, Dick Stolle, uh, who's one of the top editors in uh, Life, that they, he's been there forever. And his wife has uh, uh, lung problems and so they look to find the driest place in the, in the U.S. and they, they're in the process of moving to Albuquerque. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and But he's going to stay on with life and he was going to write, I mean those two big life books or picture books for him, uh, he did those by himself. Yeah. They made about a million and a half or more on each book. So they can they can well afford it if he doesn't do anything, because he just on, on salary and still is. Yeah. But they're going to let him work from from Albuquerque and yeah. cover in the Los Angeles, whatever whatever he wants to do, because he we, always produces. We just love those Life magazines. You probably know here in the library. I've gone on eBay and we've got every one from 1936, the very first issue, up to 1949, yeah. all around. And world. that has a in uh, Nebraska on the cover. Of Made by Burke White. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'll show you. <laughs> now, did you know? Uh, did you know her? Did you know Henry Luce and uh, Claire? I can't Bruce? say I know. I attended some meetings in, uh, in the Beverly Hills Bureau that he spoke, but I can't say. That. Why do you think life was so much more successful than any of the other? They spent a lot more money and went for the best stuff. Uh, I think that. I mean. Every, everybody, when that magazine started, uh, it grew so fast it was ten cents. Yeah. They couldn't afford it. <laughs> and their, but their circulation, when you, you know, it's just... Oh, it's six million. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and I was... And everybody saved them. Yeah, I, I mean, I thought even now you can find, you know, you can find oh. any of them that you want. And but I think it's because there were so many around. I mean, yeah. you know, a lot of them have been lost, but... I <clears throat> When I was settled in Los Angeles, maybe I had one or two copies of something. But since then, I have a, a niece 
in the Chicago area, and she, she sends me one periodically. She finds yeah. all the uh, old stuff. And so you're, I'd like for you sometime to, um, I, um, because not only do we have of the 40s, but I have some, but not all of the 50s and 60s. And if you, I'd like to find or see some of the stuff that you did, if you have some stuff in any of those publications, if you know the dates yeah, that, that they are. Oh, well, that's like what to, she looks up and sees my credits there while she sends them in the back. I probably have a half a dozen. Now. Do you? Oh, yeah, yeah. And just the other day, uh, it's been a couple of weeks now, a man called me from Seattle about a story I did that included him in North in Laos 44 years ago. Oh. And I, I invited him out. He was out here. Uh, that, uh, Peggy had a party, as you know, and we invited him to that, and I took him around to see some things there. Okay. So where'd you say, in Laos? Where you did it? In Laos, no, oh. on Dr. Tom Dooley. Oh yeah, okay. I did the story. Did you? Like, okay, oh, we were just talking about Dr. Tom Dooley the other day. Bob Andrade was mentioning it. Um, he's been reading up on him. And he said, very interesting person. Oh yeah, he really was. I, I first ran into, oh this is not on what we're Dr. Well, okay, we'll talk about that after. Let's let's go back to now. You went to uh, so you went to L.A. and you started working full time for Life out of their yeah. office there. But that that doesn't. We're not talking about the war now. Oh no no I don't oh. want no no that's okay I oh, okay. Uh, that's where I want to I still want to talk about other stuff. Oh okay. Uh, that, that you, you know like I don't want to get off the track. Oh, oh no 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 we're on the track that's Good. fine. Okay. Let, let's kind of back up just a little bit then. So you're in in L.A. and. Do you, are you traveling a lot out of, well, out of no, L.A. Well, I just or, or went what? to the, um, stopped at the three cities where, where I had uh, written to L.A. And I think they would have hired me, but I, I, it's too much. Right. I mean, they had no, no, what I mean is when you're working in L.A., did you stay, did you stay mostly in L.A. to do your stuff or did you uh, travel around uh, different um, places? Oh, no, I, I tra traveled. Not a lot because I did a lot of things. Movies, of course, I used to have Life Goes to the Movie or Movie of the Week in, in Life. Oh, right, yes. And, and I covered some of that. Did you? And in the studios. And uh, I went to um, uh, Hawaii a number of times. Mm -hmm. And uh, I ended up, I moved out to Hawaii and, and lived there 10 years. Oh, we did. Mm -hmm. When did you? When, uh, what years were you out there? I went out there. Let's see. Moved to LA in '60. I guess it was around '65 mm -hmm. or '60. And of course, we we were expecting life to fold, as they were talking about, it. and it did fold in 1972. Okay. And uh, then they brought it back. And then it, but people say, why did they quit? Because television came in and got the advertising dollar. Uh -huh. The reason they were able to turn a product like that is because uh, they had the advertising dollars to do it. And they, mm -hmm. they got great rates because of their circulation. Mm -hmm. When you were in Hawaii, did you get over to Vietnam at all? When, when no, the war I, was I didn't. I, I wasn't looking forward to it. No. I figured World War II, I had enough risk. Yeah. And I'd use up my wrists, so. <laughs> and uh, so. But uh, Peggy and I, uh, I've been to a, B Vietnam a couple okay. of mm -hmm. years ago, and uh, and loved the, the cities there. So um, when you were living in Hawaii, did you kind of cover the Far East then, or, or no, what, no? What did you do? I I set up a company called Hawaii Tapeters. Okay, well, okay, so you're not with life anymore? When oh, you're, no, no. Oh, okay, all right. No. Okay. I just got out and uh, I did do in the first one of the first issues of People magazine, uh, Arthur Murray and his wife dancing on the beach at Waikiki. Oh. <laughs> and I did, I did stories for them, but it took me about six months to use up away. So, what kind of a, uh, a business did you start over there? Hawaii Tape Tours uh, deal with uh, Hertz uh, 
put the tours on tape, you know. Oh, I see. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, and uh, in four cities, Hertz had them on the counter for rent. Oh. People would rent them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I ended up doing some work for Hertz and uh, uh, then uh, we stayed there 10 years. I, I also, when I first went over there, um, I, um, uh, I think the first assignments were living in Los Angeles. I had a number of assignments in Hawaii. And one of the first times we went, we stayed at the Ilikai Hotel and they were, uh, put us up nicely and so on. And they were trying to sell us uh, to buy an apartment or apart you know. And I said, what the hell would I do an apartment in the middle of the Pacific Ocean? They said, well, the Pan Am pilots were buying them and so on. Uh, so I forgot about that. And a couple of years later, the Ilikai was doing fine. So I bought one. You have to practically pay 10 cents down and, and be responsible for the monthly payments. That's the way they sold the hotel. Well, so I bought one, uh, uh, what was it, 500, 500 square feet, I think, or a little, very small studio. Mm -hmm. And it was very little down. Well, and later on, that worked, uh, I bought a one bedroom, which I forget, 17, about 1700. Anyway, it wasn't that big. And later on, I sold them, and uh, it turned out to be a great deal. Now, when did you meet Peggy? Um, I think 1988. Okay. Uh, and we, we met in Washington. Oh, you did? We were. Uh, the, um, what's the president's friend, friend that ran the USIA? Charlie? Charlie, yeah. what's his last name? Um, anyway, um, we were invited to, uh, to go for this thing. And his wife was chairman of the uh, um, foundation for, what's the name of the theater? For the Lincoln Ford, Ford Theater. Ford Theater Foundation. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. And she was coming down from New York, and uh, Pascal, a friend of mine, and I did a lot of work for her. She sculptures in glass and does other things. And so, she said, well, why, you've got to go to Washington and, because uh, uh, I forget Charlie's wife's name. Anyway, she was in charge of this promotion. And I said, I don't want to go to, to Washington. And, uh, and uh, I said, you know, to be alone without somebody. And um, so uh, she did the same thing to, to Peggy because Peggy had purchased some of her works, and we have them in the house, glass sculptures. And uh, so she finally talked Peggy into going, saying that she had a couple of guys, her, her uh, cosmetic surgeon and a photographer, retired photographer from Life magazine, so you'll have somebody to escort you. Well, I, we started the thing at, um, at uh, a hotel, a dining room in, in Washington. It was a three-day uh, deal, and uh, so she talked Peggy into coming down, and I took one of Armand Hammer, Armand Hammer was part of this group, one of his limousines and went out to the airport and met her, and from then on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and she uh, her, she had a husband and had, had, had Alzheimer's for ten years, and she uh, uh, moved him from New York to uh, Palm Springs, mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, anyway, uh, at that time I was coming down to Palm Springs occasionally, and uh, after when the project ended, I said, "Well, I get to Palm Springs, Katie. May I take you to dinner sometime? What do you want to do that for?" Oh, on guard. And I said, I just thought it would be a nice thing to do. <laughs> so, anyway, that's how we met. And, and I came to, and she came to Los Angeles. And then, you know, there was the opera or the symphony, something in New York. 
And a great thing that happened that helped that romance was uh, Eastern Airlines was flying, and for a thousand dollars, I think uh, if you were sixty or thereabouts, you could get a, a unlimited pass for an hour. I mean, for a, a year. So I I could fly to, to New York on the weekends and take her to dinner. <laughs> and but that was a great deal. Oh, no limit on it. My goodness. I wish I could get that again. Yeah. We'd go. We'd go to New York for, for dinner. Yeah. <laughs> so you were working in L.A. at the time? You, uh, at the, you had come back from Hawaii. And, right. And did you come back to Los Angeles when you came yeah, back? Yeah, I came back Hawaii? to Los Angeles. And, yeah. and what, did you, what, what kind of work were you doing, did you do then uh, in Los well, Angeles? I, I did a lot of work for Pascal, the sculptors. Mm -hmm. And I, I just freelanced and so on. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I didn't work for life because there wasn't any. <laughs> uh -huh. 1972 was when it when, folded the first time. And then it came back in about 76 or something, I think. Yeah. Or something. It didn't work. Now it's back now. Yeah. Except we don't get it in our paper. They have a supplement like Parade or those. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I saw that the other day. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, somebody because they made a big thing about, well, right. life is back. Yeah, they, because they had, I remember they, I don't know, it, I saw one of them somewhere. Uh -huh. know, but it's still, it's not the same thing, though. It's, oh, no. <laughs> Yeah. No, they take people stuff and put it in life. You know, People is now the most su successful magazine in the country. Uh -huh. I forget. They're up in millions of circulation. Yeah. But what they do, they took the People section from life and made a separate magazine out of it. This friend of mine uh, oh. did that. I mean, Dick oh. Stolle yeah. uh, and was the first editor of it and so on. Hmm. And uh, it's very successful. And when did you move here full time to the desert then, pretty much? Um, let's see. It was sometime in the 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, do you do any um, more photography? Do you do much photography now? I, no, I never bring the camera. I still have two Nikons and all the attachments. Now I have two Olympus. Those that big, you know, <laughs> one with a thir 38 to um, t telephoto, uh -huh. and the other is just a straight 38. No, it, it has a little uh, zoom to it, but that's what I use. They, I think one weighs, weighs an ounce and a half. <laughs> The guys over in Iraq now that uh, you know the photographers and stuff. What what kind of what what are they oh, using? You're talking about stills. I, I have no idea. Yeah. What we see is videotape. They still have those cameras. The cameras that, hot, yeah. Right. And now the, the big issue is did the did the GI murder the guy that was? Uh, I, I'm I'm not for front front line combat stuff. Because you don't know what the background of the circumstances. Exactly. Yeah. And right. they did that one thing. They showed that one shot. For some, uh, a GI shot a supposedly an injured man, and now there's a, going to be a congressional investigation, and so we. Uh, I, I'm not for any nice wars where they they sue sue the troops for no, doing absolutely. their job. Exactly, because you don't know that guy oh, you could have had a hand grenade, for... could have done anything, yeah. you know, and he, he got to protect yep, you're right. Um So, uh, how many children do you have then? What? How many children did you have? Well, my first marriage, yeah. four. Four. Uh -huh. Of course, they're all in their forties. <laughs> <laughs> Do any of them live around here, or where did no, they? No, no, they they live in uh, Fort Worth, Dallas area, oh. Texas, and one daughter lives on the east coast. But after when the door of divorce came, my wife was bitter. Well, I understand that. I, I, it's either keep the marriage or uh, or give up life. And I'd always wanted to work for life. Yeah. I, 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 that's why I remember the first copy, being on the, in the drugstore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, do you have any grandchildren? I think I have a. My wife was very bitter, and she didn't want me to see the children again. And so, and shortly after we were divorced, I um, went to a court and had a lawyer going to have them. And the three oldest ones came out to to visit me. It was not a pleasant experience. They were fine, but they had problems like 
the thing I remember most, the, uh, the oldest child, a uh, daughter, uh, my, took my son and she'd pinch, yeah. the, the, uh, you know, I couldn't stand that. Yeah. And he was a good kid. Yeah. He was uh, uh, murdered in a holdup. Oh. Uh, he was in charge of a series of theaters in Central Texas and two guys came, followed him to his office. He had been out collecting the money. And often shot him in the back of the head and took the mm -hmm. money. Mm -hmm. Nice kid, too. Yeah. Um, I know you and Peggy are quite uh, involved in charities and a lot of things here in the desert, including the Air Museum. Yes. How did you get uh, interested in the Air Museum? Uh, well, of course, I, I thought know it was a great thing they were doing, managing it. For it to keep the planes flying, that was uh, that, and and I just I I thought it was a good project. Well, we're sure glad to have you. You're on the board, I know, and I know you, our gift shop, uh, you've helped out yes, with I, that. Uh, I go over and give them a pep talk. <laughs> well, you've done more than giving them pep you, talk. talk yeah, I know that. Is that water? All right. My, sure. My yeah. mouth got okay. so dry that, that practically my tongue sticks to my, yeah. my mouth. Sure, go right ahead. Yeah. Then I talk funny. <laughs>